We both have our hoop earrings. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Perspectives. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Today, we're going to talk about a different type of dementia um, called frontal temporal lobe dementia. We have joining with us um, at Katie Brandt. Katie and I met a couple years ago at the Alzheimer's Association um, conference in London, and she really has an amazing story um, about how FTD changed her life. Um, her husband, was diagnosed at a very early age, at the age of 29 years old, um, and has since um, sa sadly passed away. Um, Katie, though, now has dedicated her life um, to awareness from the caregiver's perspective. Um, she's head of caregiver support services at MassGen, working with one of the leading experts um, of FTD. So, Katie, thanks so much for joining us. Of course, Deborah. Thank you for having me and shining a light on FTD. We're so appreciative. So, Katie, let's just first start because I, I mean, I know your story. A lot of people um, who are, are viewing right now may not. Um, but let's start with your husband and, and what happened um, from those earlier days. I mean, he was extraordinarily young um, at age 29. It's really hard to associate the word dementia with 29 years old. Yeah, my husband, Mike, actually, I have our, I always show this picture. People who know me know that I bring it, bring it out a lot. So Mike and I, uh, we got married when we were young. We were just 22. Uh, Mike was so brilliant. He had his uh, bachelor's in um, theology and his master's in philosophy, and he became a high school theology teacher. Mike had the ability to translate text from Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And one of his early symptoms was that I remember standing with him and we were trying to make a grocery list and he couldn't spell the word rice or avocado. He started uh, getting having a hard time. He had a small business where he would do web design because he was an amazing coder and developed these beautiful web pages for his clients. And he started getting in trouble because he wasn't meeting his deadlines. His work just wasn't that beautiful, high quality work at all. And he didn't notice or even understand why his clients were unhappy with his product. So we, yeah. So, so we often hear that it's the work first that people start noticing, oh, something's not quite right. And, and you know, I mean, we, we've talked to many people who say, oh, uh, I wasn't performing at the, the rate I, I had been in the past, I was definitely slipping. Were those the very first signs to, to Mike himself or were other people like yourself noticing, um, you know, odd behavior? Yeah, so a, an early sign with Mike was, Mike was very gregarious and social and outgoing. And very early on, he sort of became more socially withdrawn. And I started getting phone calls from our friends saying, is Mike mad at me? When I call, he doesn't want to talk. He never wants to hang out. And I noticed that uh, the man who once I rode in a seven hour car trip with a broken rail, we were both disappointed when we arrived at our destination because we were so happy chatting that you know he didn't want to talk at dinner or at night. Um, and it just was, you know, it seemed like he just wasn't interested in engaging. So, um, we often, when we talk or when we talk to people who have um, FTD or who have experienced a caregiver uh, looking after someone with FTD, they often talk about the behavior, not necessarily the memory. Is Was that true in the case of Mike? Is it behavior that comes through like odd, exhibiting odd behavior before rather than forgetfulness? Right, so you wanna think about uh, Alzheimer's disease. Now, everyone knows I'm not a doctor, right? But I have um, worked with a lot of families. So if you think of Alzheimer's disease beginning in the back of the brain and in that the hippocampus, and that's where we think about memory. The front of the brain is the part of your brain that makes you, you. It's your executive function, it's your impulse control, um, it's things that make you say, is it a good idea to spend $5,000 on this boat online? Or should I walk across a semi-frozen lake in the early spring at one in the morning, which is something that Mike wanted to do. Um, you know, so 
often it's not that they forget how to do things and that's why they can get themselves in trouble because they know how to use their credit card online. They know how to drive the car. They know how to get to where they're going, but maybe they're not making the best decision about is now the right time to go to this location? Should I spend this amount of money? Should I make this comment to someone out in public? So what did that look like with Mike? I mean, what I, you were obviously um, the person closest to him. Yeah. Um, what, when did you start to see behavioral changes and specifically what were those behavioral changes? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, that being socially withdrawn. So Mike was the kind of guy, he would come home on a Tuesday night after a day of work and he would say to me, I really miss you. Let's have a date tonight. Like, you know, just we were very connected. And uh, after our son was born, it would be, uh, my, our son was born at the end of March. And so it would be a beautiful day in June and or July. And I would say, let's go out for the day. And he would say, no, you go. I don't want to go with you. I mean, that's crazy to think of Mike not wanting to hang out with us. Um, Mike developed an odd obsession. Um, everybody loves Harry Potter and we read all the books, but Mike became obsessed with the Harry Potter audiobooks. That's over 117 hours of audio. He wanted to start with the first book and listen all the way through to the seventh without being interrupted. He would listen to it in the car, on Bluetooth in the kitchen, earbuds in his ears all hours of the day and night. It was strange behavior for a man who was 29, but the hard thing about it is that behavior, as odd as it was, it doesn't, it didn't lead me to think I should call his primary care physician because it wasn't a medical behavior, right? So um, what were you actually, I mean, this is a really important point for a caregiver, you know, because obviously you're not thinking dementia, you're not thinking, oh, something's wrong. You're just thinking, wow, my husband's acting really strange. Right. So what, what, at what point, where was the turning point for you where you thought, hmm, this is, we need to go get this checked out? So unfortunately, the turning point for us was around safety. So Mike was um, drinking and driving. And that was completely outside of his character. Mike was a huge proponent of being safe and cared so much, not only about, of course, his own safety, the safety of the people he loved, but even just safety of those in the community. And so that's what led us to go to the hospital um, and to say, you know, something has got to be wrong here. What is happening? And it was really my mother um, who kept pushing me to, she said, you have to ask the doctor about his brain. And I remember, telling her mom, there's nothing wrong with this brain. I remember saying that to her and she was right. Yeah. Well, I think most people would think that, right? I mean, you're not looking for, so, so are young. Yeah. And, and the, the behavioral changes are tricky because a lot of people could probably, I imagine a lot of people would tell you, Oh, it's depression or, Oh, it's something else, right? You're not thinking so, what happened? Tell us about that experience of getting diagnosed. Um, and at that time, you were no expert in FTD, like who, the person who you are today. Right. Um, uh, so tell us about that, that journey getting diagnosed. I mean, again, we hear so much confusion for patients and their loved ones about going to the doctors and trying to find the answers. Um, what was that like for you? Yeah, so Mike was misdiagnosed by eight different medical and mental health professionals. He spent an overnight in the hospital, had many tests, and spent a week in a secure psychiatric facility. And all of those diagnoses came back as some form of depression. Here is where I really want to pause for a moment and highlight uh, all of the resources and benefits that I have as an educated middle-class woman um, who felt comfortable saying to medical professionals, I don't think you're right and, and going to the next person. I think we all need to, to think about the challenges in diagnosis when people don't have access to resources, high quality healthcare and specialists. So at the time we were living in out, just outside of Concord, New Hampshire, um, and my family had been, my father had been being seen by the director of cognitive neurology at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. So we were able to bring Mike down after his eighth misdiagnosis. And the doctor there was able to diagnose him quite easily because at a 
high quality academic medical center, they have experience with the rare and unusual. So but, wait, Katie, we should we should get in now that because I, I forgot to mention this that your dad also suffered from Alzheimer's disease at that same time. Yeah, so unfortunately, husband was diagnosed with FTD. My mother passed away unexpectedly, and then a couple of weeks later, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, I really have had the perspective of what it's like to be a caregiver for the two different dementias and also the caregiver experience as a spouse and the caregiver experience as an adult child. I, I really uh, truly can't imagine what that must have been like. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, as someone with a mom with Alzheimer's, it's so consuming, but to have a husband and a father at the same time, I, I truly can't even imagine what that's like. Yeah, I mean, it really, uh, it upended my, my life. Um, I have spoken publicly about the fact that at that time, I uh, left my job, or my career really, in the child welfare system, and I lost our home to foreclosure and ended up spending our retirement savings. And we were so lucky to benefit from supports from uh, the state of Massachusetts to help to keep us going. But, you know, again, I think about we know there is data that says from, so the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration funded a study by Dr. James Galvin that showed that the costs of caring for a loved one with FTD are almost twice that of caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease. And if you think about it, FTD has a typical age of onset of 52. Now we know that Mike was a big outlier. But that's a full 20 years earlier than the typical age of onset for Alzheimer's, a time when people are likely at the peak of their careers, sending kids to college, still paying a mortgage. So when they need full-time care, their spouse is still at work. So what happens is they have to pay for full-time care for their loved one. Whereas if you're both retired, you likely still need to pay for some supports you know, to give the, your loved one a break, but it's probably not that same burden as when you're working full time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's hard to comprehend, um, you know, how a lot of people make that financially work. I mean, the, the, the care cost um, is enormous. But before we, we go into the financials a little bit more, I, I want to talk to you about, again, bring back to the diagnosis, because you said yeah. you were fortunate enough to see someone eventually after you said eight doctors, um, you were fortunate enough to come into contact with someone who w was able to recognize the symptoms that Mike had and attribute it to, to FDD. But so what is it that he did in diagnosis? Because I think this is the piece where that, that's common across many dementias, which is how do you distinguish one for, from another? And in the end, you know, does it matter in terms of caregiving? Whoa, okay. Well, so for diagnosis, I think that the thing that uh, I've had the privilege to watch is the amazing clinical team at the in the MGH Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit led by Dr. Brad Dickerson, and I've really watched them be detectives. So I think what's hard for families is unfortunately they often have to wait for that first appointment with Dr. Dickerson. And when they get in, they're hoping, okay, today's the day we're gonna get the diagnosis but it really is like putting together a puzzle. They need the history, to sometimes lab work, maybe blood work, cerebrospinal fluid, imaging. Um, it's so important, maybe neuropsychological testing, to put all those things together. And that's what they did for my husband as well. But I will tell you that I think that the, the doctor who initially correctly diagnosed him, it was because of his many years of experience. Um, that he could recognize it. And the history, I think, was very powerful to him, the odd behaviors. So we're getting a, a question from um, one of our, our viewers saying, you know, is there a specific test or diagnostics for um, frontal temporal lobal dementia? Um, so when you when you say it's a, it's a, a detective, you know, it's kind of put, putting all of these pieces together from blood, um, cerebral um, spinal fluid, all of that. 
what are they looking for that's different than uh, Alzheimer's disease? Uh, you know, we know it displays itself um, differently in terms of behavior, but but what are they looking for exactly? That that would be an indicator that this is not Alzheimer's, this is FTD. Oh, Deborah, you're really testing my, my <laughs> scientific hat. At, where's Brad? We need to get him on with me. So, and again, if Dr. Dickerson is listening, I know he'll be be kind uh, to my response. But think about it this way. What we know is that there is a small percentage of families being with net FTD. And if you have questions about that, you can go on the uh, website for the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, theAFTD.org, and find out more about genetic connections. So people could get a blood test and find out do you have that genetic marker? Likely you would also have family history, okay? Was that the case for Mike? Did he have family members with FTD? No, he didn't. And we meet a lot of people like that and it seems like, it's like they've been struck by lightning. So that would be the majority of the cases that we would work with, right? So again, a small percentage, but something to look for. So then think about what we know about Alzheimer's disease is that there is that prevalence of amyloid. So if you don't have that, if you have your uh, lumbar puncture and your cerebral fluid is don't elevated levels of amyloid, then that's something to say. It's likely your frontal temporal disorder is likely not caused by the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So it's it's interesting as you're talking, Katie. Uh, we're getting a lot of comments um, a, a about this topic, and I, I tell you, this comes up all the time, um, no matter what dementia you're talking about. Um, but someone um, has commented saying, "It's been 12 years of misdiagnosis for us. We're finally being seen by a collaborative team um, at the University of Utah next week. The okay. physicians in our area, including neurologists, don't even know what." FTD is as a disease. Do you think, I mean, you're, you're, at, you're at an institution obviously who, who specializes, they have a special department for FTD, but you mentioned this briefly before, access to people who actually have this depth of knowledge for FTD appears to be quite difficult, is it not? Of course it is difficult. You know, one of the things that we know is that it can even be difficult for folks to receive an accurate Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. If you live in a rural area, um, if you don't have access to a specialist. So if we think of, if it's difficult to find someone that has expertise in Alzheimer's disease, and then FTD is a rare dementia, it's a related dementia. So what I would say is if you, if your loved one is experiencing cognitive difficulties, changes in behavior, and if when doctors are talking to you about their diagnosis and it just, isn't sitting right with you, go on the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration's website, theAFTD.org, and look up the members of the Medical Advisory Board. See if there's anyone close to you or in driving distance, or we've had people get on planes to come and see Dr. Dickerson. Um, anyone can call the 1-800 number for AFTD and ask them, how can I find a neurologist close to me so that I can bring my loved one for a consultation. Does does memory issues appear in FTD patients? Do they start to experience, is it behavior first and then memory or is it mainly just behavior? So what we wanna think about with FTD is that often it affects the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. And it just in a very simplified way, if your FTD starts in your frontal lobe, you're likely going to have behavior changes first. If it is affecting the temporal lobes, which is in charge of communication, speaking, reading, then you're likely going to have problems with talking and communication first. We do have patients that experience issues with memory. Um, but one thing that's interesting is I was lucky to go to the Spring National Institute for Health Summit on the related dementias. And one of the uh, presentations was about how these related dementias sometimes have co-occurring things happening in the brain. So just because you have FTD doesn't mean that you might not also have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease can happen in collaboration um, with other progressive neurological disorders and impact memory. 
I, I've said this before, but I once spoke with a pathologist who told me that over 75% of the autopsies he does on dementia patients is often a combination of two dementias. It's not just one. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that we always think this is how complex the brain is and how much more we need to understand about what, how one thing relates to another. Um, you know, we still don't have a lot of that information. Right. And also when you think about memory, Dr. Dickerson was just talking about this recently, but think of the idea of you need to have attention to something. So many of our FTD patients, one of their early symptoms is apathy. If you don't care about what your partner's saying, if you're not interested in it, you're not likely gonna give it attention and then encode it so that you can retrieve it later. So right. it might not be that you're having a memory problem, but if you have an attention problem to store the things that can look like a memory problem. So Katie, we have another question um, about, do people with FTD usually progress um, rapidly or is it different for different people? So, you know, we know Alzheimer's progression, it can, it can take a while. I mean, you know, eight to 10 years before you, I mean, we talk to a lot of people with early onset Alzheimer's, they're very functional, they're normal people. I hate to use that word, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. I often say, well, it doesn't seem like you have Alzheimer's and, um, you know, on the surface. Um, so what is it like for FTD? Is it, is it, is it a faster in, you know, with your experience with Mike and now with your expertise from the caregiver's perspective and, and being around so many people impacted, is it, is it a fa faster pro progression um, or, or is it about the same? Is it, does it last, you know, a number of years? So I believe that the statistic uh, that's out is that FTD would last seven to 10 years. But again, that's so variable based on when your loved one is diagnosed, right? And then if we think about Mike, from diagnosis to the end of the course of his disease, it was just over three years. Um, one of the things that I think we do see is that for our patients that are living with FTD and motor neuron disease, FTD and ALS together, they seem to have a faster course and maybe our younger patients as well. Um, but we've also had patients that have lived well beyond a decade. Uh, I think the answer is yes, it varies by person, um, and it likely it matters when you're diagnosed along the course of your disease as well. So interesting, you mentioned ALS. Is there a, a known link between the two diseases? Yeah, so in 2012, a genetic marker um, found on gene C9 or 72 uh, is known to have a connection between ALS and FTD, where if you talk to family members, they may say, oh, my, I had an uncle with FTD and I had a grandparent with ALS, and really it's the, the, a mutation on that same gene. What is the, you, you talked about the genetic component earlier. What is, um, do, do we have a specific gene related to FTD that's been identified? And if so, what is it? So there, we work with an amazing uh, genetic specialist, Diane Lucente, and uh, I feel like I've learned a lot from her and there would be endless amounts of information for me to continue to learn. But if you look on the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration's website under genetics, they will talk about some of the known uh, genetic mutations that have been identified. And that would be some of the big ones are progranulin, uh, MAPT, the C9 or 72. But I think that there's still a lot that we're learning, right? Right. Um, and so right now there's just been a small group identified. Okay, and um, another view is, uh, viewer is asking, how long before diagnosis did Mike's behavioral symptoms show up? Um, I think I would say confidently a whole year, a whole year. But I think of Mike as a person with a lot of cognitive resilience, right? He was master's level educated, uh, read three newspapers a day. We, we talk a lot to our patients and caregivers about what can you do to strengthen your brain so that when the neurodegenerative disease is trying to attack it, it's attacking a hard marble instead of a soft sand. 
And I think that for our patients that had additional years of education and had very academic lives, it did provide some protection. Of, I mean, of course, the FTD must have been brewing in his brain before we saw the symptoms. And you, you said before he had no, I mean, no one else in his family had um, FTD or, or Alzheimer's for that matter? Correct. Yeah. So, but I you mean, know, he, you never know. Um, and so we take family histories from folks, but sometimes they have loved ones who died younger. And, um, you know, sometimes we meet people who are adopted. And so family history is one piece, but it's not the thing that you would solely rely on. So Katie, I love the work that you're doing at MassGen. Um, it's so incredibly badly needed on all fronts. Um, so what would you say to our audience right now if they um, have just received a diagnosis of FTD for themselves or their loved ones? What's the way forward? I would say there's no way forward but together. And I would say that we don't have a cure for FTD today, but we have a cure right this minute for the isolation and loneliness that can come with an FTD diagnosis. And there are different ways you can connect. The online communities are very, uh, they're so vibrant. And you really, you can find patient connections, caregiver connections, and then reach out and find a support group. And just because you don't have an FTD specific support group in your area, try and attend a young onset Alzheimer's disease support group. Um, Deborah, you asked me a little bit ago, you know, is it different caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's versus FTD? I think that maybe some of the technical behavioral tactics that you'll use, but the services and the supports and the emotions and the grief that you'll feel, and even the successes when you feel like, oh my gosh, we made a trip to the dentist and nobody yelled. You know, those things will, will be there regardless of a Lewy body, an FTD, or an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Absolutely. This is an interesting question that's just come on, which is, can concussion bring on FTD? We know now there's a link between concussion and, um, you know, dementia. So does that apply to FTD? So I asked Dr. Dickerson, you know, one time in our chats, very specifically this question, and he said, no, the concussion, I think based on the many different uh, presentations and talks that I've been to, what we know is that when a brain is injured, um, it makes it more vulnerable to things later. Um, not that it would necessarily cause a dementia, but just it's not a positive thing for your brain to receive multiple concussions or damage in that way. So the progression of Mike's um, FTD it, after diagnosis, was was it a slippery slope or was it up and down? Like Alzheimer's to me, like when, when I um, watch what my mom's going through, I didn't expect it to be so up and down. You know, there's some days where we're like, oh, she's doing great. And other days where we're like, oh, she's not doing so well. Is it the same for FTD? I think that, um, for Mike in particular, he seemed to have a downward slope. But I will say for our family and many of the families I work with, receiving a diagnosis, accepting what's happening with your loved one, removing the expectation that your loved one is going to still behave in the manner they did before and putting in some supports, we often do see a bump in, in functioning and a reduction in anxiety and stress because you've changed the dynamic, right? You may, might have changed the environment, the routine, and the expectations, yeah. Katie, thank you so much for this time, your time and advice, really. I think it's so important that people who have lived through this really guide people who are going through it. And I mean, you've gone really so much further by dedicating your life to this um, and working with um, Dr. Brad Dickerson at MassGen. Um, just tell us a little bit um, before we end about the type of work that you are doing um, with people who are confronted with FTD. Yeah, so, you know, I uh, love that Brad Dickerson is so supportive of community events. You know, I've been saying that just because dementia has come into your life doesn't mean the joy has to go out. And so we plan family bowling events, black tie galas. Um, you know, tomorrow night we're having a music and mingle. 
because people still want to make new memories of joy. And so we want to offer opportunities for people to just come together as a community and feel that they belong somewhere. So that's one of my favorite things that I'm doing along with the advocacy work and caregiver support um, and fundraising and research support. And how do keep, people keep abreast of your work or get in touch um, with you know, some of the support groups, et cetera? Yeah, so if you go to the, our website, ftd-boston.org, you'll find the MGH Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit, and you can email us in our general email box. Um, you can also reach me at katiebrandt.org. That's my personal website. And we send out emails and I run support group at Newton Wellesley Hospital the last Tuesday night of every month. Um, I just had my 10th anniversary. And I asked That's Dr. Dickerson, is there a pin if you go to more than 100 <laughs> FTD support groups? That's amazing. And Katie, thank you so much for your work and what you do and how you really dedicated um, your life to a very, very needed cause. Um, it's it, You have you know, an amazing story um, and one that with, you know, started with hardship that a lot of people can't even imagine, um, but you've turned it into something really positive for the community. So we're very appreciative of that. Thanks, Deborah. I had a wonderful husband and, um, you know, all that love had to go somewhere. So if you want to see if you've missed part of this interview, you want to see it uh, in its entirety, we always post um, our Being Patient Perspectives and Brain Talk interviews um, with the expert community on beingpatient.com. Uh, you'll see the tab under video, so please uh, go there. We, uh, it is our intention to elevate the first person perspective or the caregiver's perspective into the conversation on dementia. Uh, so keep checking back with us. We'll have many more of these. And thanks so much, Katie, for your time. Thanks, everyone. Take care.